This video is intended as a follow-up to my two earlier response videos to SG Collins. If you haven't seen those responses, go watch them first. In December 2012, he released a video entitled Moon Hoax Not, which has unfortunately gained an enormous amount of widespread and undeserved attention, and the subject matter of his video has been echoed verbatim by many news websites and propagandists. The basic premise of his video is that NASA could not have faked the Apollo moon landings because the high-speed video cameras needed to fake it simply did not exist in 1969. The pivotal claim for the Apollo hoax theory, without which it all falls apart, is that what we saw on TV was slow motion footage of astronauts running around in a film studio. Because if it wasn't slow motion, it couldn't have happened on Earth, right? Let's talk about how slow motion works in film and video. There are two ways to make motion slow. One is you shoot it at normal speed and play it back slow. The other is you shoot it fast and play it back normal. The second way is called overcranking. It looks smoother and more realistic because you're sampling natural motion at a higher frame rate. But that means we would have had to shoot it on film using high speed film cameras, right? Why? Uh, because in 1969 there were no high speed video cameras yet. The electronics just weren't there. Some people did have a magnetic disc recorder that could capture normal speed video and play it back slow. They used it for sports replays. It could record up to 30 seconds. Play back at uh, 10 FPS and you've got a whopping 90 seconds of slow-mo. So if we're faking this with electronic slow-mo at one-third speed, we only need to record about 47 minutes of continuous live-action video. Well, that's a lot more than that Ampex disc recorder could hold. But NASA is special. Maybe they have a big disc recorder, right, in 1969. Okay, how much bigger? 95 times bigger? I don't know, man. I mean, government agencies are powerful, but they're not God. My response to this nonsense was straight to the point. In response to the first claim that high-speed video cameras did not exist in 1969, I provided a link to this Motion Video Products website with this clear statement. Up to the early 1960s, film was the only medium available to record motion that was too fast for observation. In the late 1960s, the development of reliable video technology gave researchers and engineers another tool for motion analysis and the benefit of immediate review of the recorded event. And in response to his second claim that the Ampex HS100 disc recorder was not large enough to store the entire Apollo 11 telecast, I pointed out that there was no need to store the video on the disc recorder. While it is true that the HS100 could only record and store 30 seconds of video footage, it was also possible to feed recordings from normal videotape into it. The technology of Ampex's HS100 slow-mo disc recorder was derived from their video file information retrieval system. Obviously in the 1960s, when computers were gigantic and could do very little things, we did not have PDFs or JPEGs or other digital image files to store scans of documents on. Instead, they were stored on reel-to-reel -reel videotapes, such as 2-inch quadruplex. To view these scans, you would feed 30 seconds of videotape recordings into the disc recorder and then play them back in stop-action format. For the purposes of video editing, Ampex released a much larger unit called the HS200 Teleproduction System. This remarkable device had all the functions of the HS100 and then some. Not only could you feed videotape recordings into the disc recorder, you could even pre-mark the frames you wanted so the machine would only capture those. Obviously, if you were using disc recorders to fake the Apollo telecasts, all you'd need do is record the astronauts running around suspended by wires at normal speed on videotape, then take that videotape and feed it into the disc recorder 30 seconds at a time. Then you'd simply record that disc recorder's playback on a second videotape. Rinse and repeat. Shortly after I posted this video response, Collins himself posted a comment basically saying that he enjoyed the film and that the disc recorder method I described could be done, provided they could get frame accurate edits. He later made a follow-up video in which he stated that this method could be done, but only for Apollo 11, as its playback speed was only 10 frames per second, or at least that's what NASA claimed. For Apollo 11, it's easier because the playback speed is lower than NTSC. So you don't really need high-speed video per se. Jara's suggestion 
is that we record the whole event on quad, then transfer it in 30 second buckets to an Ampex HS100 disc recorder, which you can play back in slow-mo. Edit each segment back onto a quad edit master and... Eventually, you will have the entire EVA converted into slow motion and stored onto videotape. That's a good theory. Um, whether you can do it depends on whether you can make like 95 frame accurate edits between the quad machine and the disc recorder in the days before time code editing. What they did have was a system of cue tones and multiple heads which I'm told would enable frame accurate edits between those machines. So theoretically, what you're suggesting could be done. Therefore, if slow motion does give the appearance of low gravity, and if you can perform frame accurate edits between a disc recorder and a quad machine, then I think we have to promote faking Apollo 11 from impossible to not bloody likely. That's progress, right? Collins is adamant that for the later missions, we would definitely need high-speed video cameras, because those missions were broadcast at NTSC, or 30 frames per second. However, it could also be argued that this disc recorder option could also apply to the later flights. In his first video, Collins pointed out that overcranking looks smoother than playing normal speed video in slow motion. However, this actually depends on whether the normal speed video was interlaced or progressive. A television frame is made up of horizontal rows of pixels, or in the old analog days, horizontal scan lines. In progressive mode, each of these horizontal lines that make up the frame are displayed on screen at once. So 30 frames per second is just that. However, in interlaced mode, the odd numbered lines that make up the frame are displayed first, and then the even numbered lines are displayed second. And so a 30 frame per second video is actually a 60 half frame per second video. Not half as in chopped in half, but rather half the lines that make up the image. If you were to record something at 30 frames per second in progressive mode and play it back slow, the resulting video would look very jumpy and not very smooth, because playing it back slow means repeating frames to stretch out the video. However, if you were to record 30 frames per second in interlaced mode and play that back slow, lo and behold, you will get much smoother slow motion, because you actually have 60 half frames to work with, not 30 full frames. One thing that I had totally forgot about when making my first video response was that David Percy had proposed exactly what I had just described. How was the slow motion effect achieved? Well, creating these one-sixth slow simulations would have been a relatively straightforward process. First, the scene would have been photographed and recorded onto videotape at the normal rate in the US, 30 frames per second. On playback, the recording would have been slowed down to half speed. As each video frame is made up of two different fields, this will give 60 different frames of image per second, because each individual field now becomes a frame. We must remember that the live TV transmissions were filmed off TV screens for posterity. The archiving of the Apollo moonwalks was on 60mm film, just like this. Movie film has an entirely different makeup to that of a videotape recording. Film only has frames and not fields. So when the resulting footage was filmed off a TV screen, the fact that the playout of the original video was slowed down to half speed would have gone totally undetected and remain virtually undetectable. Now this is how the jump salute would have looked at normal speed before being slowed down by the method just described. Looks rather like it would on Earth, does it not? Of course, we later re-established that the playback speed was actually 67% of the record speed, not 50%. In any case, Collins maintained that high-speed video cameras did not exist in the 1960s. This is a web page for a motion analysis company, which uses high-speed imaging to troubleshoot factory production lines and study athletic performance, things like that. Things that typically involve short bursts of action and don't need full res. Jara refers back to this statement several times during his film as proof that we had high-speed video in the 1960s. I think you need to get just a little more specific, because if you look at the 1999 white paper from the same company, Chris Balch tells us that the first generation video motion analyzer became available in the 1970s. Here is the sentence in question. 
The first motion analyzers were an outgrowth of magnetic recording technology in the early 1960s, with the first generation motion analyzers commercially available in the 1970s. The key phrase is commercially available, which means made available to the public. Both the white paper and the website specifically say that in the 1960s, video gave researchers and engineers a medium other than film to use for high-speed motion studies. This indicates to me that prior to these systems becoming commercially available, they were exclusively used by scientists for research purposes. He mentions several high-speed systems from the late 70s and 80s, but doesn't list one from the 1960s. Now I know there was something called the Video Logic Instar system from 1970. It could overcrank, but it was black and white. Chris Balch mentions a color high-speed system from NAC that appeared in 1979. A TV engineer tells me there was one from Sony using a wideband one-inch recorder that could deliver 90 FPS, and that came out in the mid-80s. To fake the surface telecast from Apollo 14 onward, what we need is a color video system that we can overcrank to at least 60 FPS, and not just for short bursts, but for longer durations. And we need it by January 1971. I haven't found that system yet. If you find it, let us know. Actually, it appears that Collins has found that system. He just didn't realize it. The Videologic Instar system that Collins refers to was the first commercially available high-speed video camera that could provide broadcast quality slow motion video for up to an hour. Some sources say that it could do up to 120 frames per second. Others say it could do 960 frames per second. Now I do not know the exact date this device was released to the public. The earliest news publication that I could find was from March 1970. Even by today's standards, three months is way too brief a period to design and build a video camera system, never mind mass produce them. Videologic's work on this project must have begun sometime in 1969 at the earliest, but that is not my main point of contention here. Collins argued that this camera could not have been used to fake the telecast from Apollo's 14 to 17 because it was in black and white, while those lunar EVA videos were in colour. Previously, I counter-argued that the ability to colorize film and video existed in the 1960s, and thus, NASA could have colorized the black and white in-star recordings if they wanted to. But, it turns out they didn't need to. The following passage is from the Standard Handbook of Industrial Automation. The section in question is titled, Motion Systems Analysis, and was actually authored by a fellow called Chan of the Video Logic Corporation. A motion analysis system may be visualized as a closed circuit television CCT, system, which records motion for subsequent viewing. Critical aspects of motion analysis are frame rate, pictures per second, picture quality, and slow motion and stop action ability. One system can record 120 full screen pictures per second, or 240 split screen pictures per second. The system features a variable speed slow motion playback with high motion resolution. 3% to 15% infinitely variable. The system is designed for adverse environments and is quite portable. Television pictures can be black and white or color. As shown in figure 44, the system consists of a high resolution camera, a videotape recorder, a CRT monitor, operating controls, and a high intensity stroboscope. Here is the system that the paragraph is referring to, and the image is captioned as, Figure 44, High Speed Videotape Instant Playback Motion Analysis System, trademark Instar, Video Logic Corporation. And so, there you have it. The Instar system that Collins refers to was not only a black and white camera, it could also do color. It could record and broadcast quality for long durations, and was out long before January 1971. Well, I'd like to give a huge thank you to SG Collins. Far from proving that the slow motion video technology did not exist during the Apollo days, he has proved the exact opposite. By his own admission, he believes that the disc recorder option was theoretically possible for Apollo 11, and he has shown that the Instar system, which as we just established could also do color, was already in time for Apollo 14. Collins didn't say anything about Apollo 12, but then again, with the television camera destroyed so soon into the telecast, 
All we had from Apollo 12 was some ridiculously bright and brief shots of the astronauts descending the ladder and wandering on and off screen. You could probably reenact those yourself with a step ladder. The rest of the telecast is just a continuous shot of a ladder against an overexposed surface and black sky. Even to this day, I still receive comments and even antagonistic videos from people who saw Collins' video and are adamant that the technology for faking the moon landings did not exist at the time. But now that we know that the Instar could do colour and was ready in time for Apollo 14, hopefully now we can all put that one to rest. It doesn't matter whether you are right or wrong, using erroneous information is not going to help anyone's cause. Collins himself has openly stated that being disproved along these lines is no weight off his shoulders. Perhaps no one other than him would be more than happy to let this one go. Now, if Jara is right, then that's good news for me because uh, then it means this whole awful episode of my life can be over. I could just retract what I said and move on. I for one am equally happy to let this one go. Now if you'll excuse me, I have university to get to.